Just over a year ago, I made a two and a half hour video that took seven months to make where I played 30 games from the video game publisher Annapurna Interactive. But who's counting? However, the title of having played their entire catalog was quickly debunked by the fact that they just kept releasing games. Is there a cat out there? But with some of their games being up there in my all time favorites and the fact that the video itself has a very special place in my heart, I had the idea to keep this going annually because it sounds like fun. I love these games mostly, but we can just, we can just sweep that under the rug. We can just sweep that under the rug. I don't know. 12 minutes. It's actually the best 12 minutes of my life, <laughs> except for that time that I <laughs> but who's counting? Let's just talk about some more cool games, starting with Oh, storyteller, storyteller. Storyteller is an absolutely ingenious puzzle game that I am surprised hasn't really been a thing until now because it's such a brilliantly simple concept. You are given a set of empty panels with only a title to guide you, and you must use the scenes and characters at your disposal to fulfill the outcome of the proposed story. Oftentimes, you'll be encouraged to go one step further and rearrange your finished scene to complete an alternative ending. I find the rudimentary nature of these mechanics fascinating, because you are able to tell so many stories and goof around with so many outcomes that the fun is shared between solving the puzzles and experimenting with what is possible amongst these archetypes. The game has a delightfully dark sense of humor and lets you mix and match these elements for grim results, as well as issuing puzzles with inherently twisted dynamics. Later into the game, as more empty panels and characters and situations are introduced, it did make my head spin a little bit with what I can only really describe as that Lego diagram where you have six two by four Lego bricks and they can make like 900 million combinations. Admittedly, the game got a bit too smart for me at times, but even teasing myself by looking up part of an answer just to relieve myself of my brain racking paled in comparison to how it felt authentically solving the other puzzles. Every time I solved one, I was incredibly giddy and blooming chuffed with myself, and that feeling never withered throughout the entire experience. Now, now, when the game first came out, a lot of criticism was pointed at how short the game was. Not only because of the price, but because of how much potential was still untapped within this concept. However, in the months following its release, the developers gradually added more content, like stamps that encouraged new ways of messing with stories, dogs, and of course, Satan. And I think there is an adequate amount here that makes it definitely worth your time and money, especially if if you're like me and stare at a puzzle for upwards of 20 minutes, making little, actually no progress. And to briefly touch on the devil's lettuce, the level's devils, the level, the devil's lettuce, the devil's levels, the devil's levels. They perfectly impose themselves on existing stories to wreak even more mischief upon what can be done with these characters. Storyteller is a charmingly dark, humorous, and clever little puzzle game that I adored and had an absolute blast with. If any of this looks interesting to you, trust me, it's an absolute delight. I'm giving this one four out of five stars, baby. That's an that's a prestige. That's eighty percent. That's pretty good. Um, now, um, I guess, I, I guess now I walk to the next review. Here I go. <laughs> the magic of video editing. Moondown was the game I was most interested to play out of this bunch because it is effectively the first horror game published by Annapurna Interactive. It was previously released in two, zero, two, one, but Annapurna bought the publishing rights in two, zero, two, three and released an updated version. Unfortunately, that update didn't save itself from frequent pop-up textures and odd bugs occasionally encountered throughout, but luckily, it's a good game, so it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> Literally, anything will keep me entertained. <laughs>
The mood of Moondown is menacingly melancholic, and I love alliteration. <laughs> the most arresting element of this is the look of the game, seeped in sepia tone, which after a few hours of playtime makes everything else in the real world so much more colorful just from extensive exposure to its dreariness. The game also features completely hand-penciled textures, which render every object slightly off-putting, even in tender moments. This goat? It's so cute! I get to pet it, it's great! But it's also kind of off. This little girl? She's... <laughs> This little girl? She's supposed to be cute and innocent, but there's something else peeking through those pointed eyes. But with that quote-unquote lovingly hand-penciled style also comes an unnerving jaggedness to the experience. When you get close enough to the threats of Moondown, there is this unsettling rigid quality to their movements. It's hard to put my finger on, but I've always found this like snap and lock style of motion to be very off-putting. This style also brings out the folkier aspects of the game and its story. You are returning to your hometown of Moondown after news that your grandfather has passed. But when you arrive to see an empty grave and a charcoal barn and your grandpa cursed into wood and an old man that gives you corrupted wood powers, things get a little bit strange, let me just put it that way. And for as low as my jaw hung in bewilderment throughout my first few hours in Moondown, my interest in uncovering the true nature of events gradually upturned my confusion into addictive intrigue. But apart from just the art style, I really loved how the world involves itself to pull the main character deeper into its bizarre folksy horror. Looking at pictures or posters slowly hook in the player's vision whilst an ambiance echoes around you, like memories thrust upon you to be recalled. Looking into mirrors masterfully trick your character's perception, and subtly change things just so, to where it's almost impossible to spot the mutations as they happen. These small moments, coupled with the sharp sound design and slow, drawn-out soundtrack, really bring out the world's feel as something just as unsettling as the enemies that patrol it. Whenever you're not slowly digesting the story, the game utilizes two different mechanics, crafting and survival. Crafting is a funny word to use here, because the most extensive it ever gets outside of using an item to open a door, or open a small door with a little taxi inside, <laughs> is making coffee. You need the pot, fill that pot with water, put the pot on the stove, find some coffee, add some coffee, take the burnt wood out of the stove, put nice new pristine wood into the stove, light the fire, wait a bit, and then you got a nice hot cup of Joseph to quell your horrible anxiety. There's only six sessions total of this routine before you max out your zen, but since the perks of coffee can be optional depending on how you play, the main appeal of the process is getting a few precious moments in between scares to calmly brew some morning brown. The survival aspects of the game mainly take the form of stealthily sneaking around these enemies that pop up across your ascent to the top of this mountain village of Moondown! You can engage in combat if you so desire, or more likely when you're in a pinch, but your resources are limited and I found sneaking to just be a better way of experiencing the dread these enemies have to offer. They're scattered across several open areas that you have to traverse, and whenever you're too close, your heart beats louder and faster and eventually you can become paralyzed with fear. I felt these encounters worked better and better with each iteration and the twist and turns they introduce were all well appreciated and pretty special. Spooky. And those are my thoughts on Moondown, but if you want a TLDR, the game is absolute dog water. Don't be fooled by the overwhelmingly slash very positive reviews. The people that left a positive review on this game must have been sipping on stupid juice or just straight up hopped on bath salts while playing. Everyone, simultaneously. <laughs> Hey guys, I didn't walk here, I just took the bus. Cocoon is a game that broke my brain, but mostly in one particular instance. I don't want to spoil it, but here's a hint for all you Cocoon players out there. The logic behind this section had me quite literally stunned, and I could not process or figure out what had happened, and furthermore, how to unstuck myself. <laughs>
Cocoon is a game about worlds inside of worlds. The game gives you the simplest of controls, allowing you movement and just one interaction button, and from there births an awesomely complex adventure that pairs trippy concepts with brilliant puzzles. These worlds that you visit and explore all live inside these orbs that the player is able to shift in and out of, and those orbs operate as your expanding toolset to use for the game's puzzles. Each orb offers up their own unique mechanic that brilliantly overlap with each other, but to my joy, never got tangled up in their own web. The game never gets too big for its britches, as the sections you can explore cut you off as you advance, so you're never left wondering how far you would have to backtrack to see if you missed something. You are always in the relevant areas the game wants you to be in, without it seemingly babying you into the right direction. And I'll be honest, I don't have a whole lot to say other than that. I loved solving its puzzles and diving further into each alien world. It looks and sounds beautiful and strange and the puzzles work ingeniously with the seemingly limited toolset given to you. I love it when a puzzle game gives simple concepts and is able to effectively contort and twist them into new shapes for an ever expanding collection of clever puzzles. All right, well that's three down, one more to go. I hope this next game is just as good of a time as this one was. Ah, oh, I do love being in the past. Thirsty Suitors follows Jala Jayaratna as she returns to her hometown of Moontown. <coughs> Sorry, uh, Timber Hills, after another fling gone wrong. She's come back to catch up with the world she lit ablaze when she left, and more importantly, mend the fractured relationships of her many ex-lovers and this is done by combat. This game does a lot. When you are in more open areas, it becomes a skating game. You can practice, get combos, and develop your skills, or if you're like me, be absolute shit at skating. Seriously, I don't wanna put all the onus on the mechanic itself, but I never got the hang of how to skate. You can't adjust the camera angle, so Jala can block the soon oncoming jumps that need to be made, which unfortunately did ruin certain climactic moments later on in the game. I I also personally never felt confident in my skills, so I was always overcorrecting every action I made by jumping like a jackrabbit. I was treating this skate park like a Mario Galaxy level, where jumping is your savior from any sticky situation. Other times? It's a cooking game, which really just means a QTE portion, where you have to time button presses and do well enough to gain your parents' approval. But the central gameplay genre is combat! Ooh, not yet. <laughs> oh my god, that was beautiful! Did we get that? That was beautiful! Oh my god! That was a- that was- I'm gonna sell that to soundboard.com, I'm gonna get millions! As you encounter and face off with Jala's exes, it becomes a fighting game, with all the basic mechanics you'd expect to see, wrapped around an emotional core of talking it out with her previous lovers to attain relationship catharsis. Oh boy! Here we are! I really like the idea of using combat to instigate this confrontational back and forth between Jala and her exes, where it's not only physical damage being exchanged, but also... Emotional damage. However, with a somewhat pre-scripted resolve to be attained through the course of combat, a very precise balance needs to be achieved, one that I feel the game rarely succeeds at. You need to be able to maintain a fun and engaging battle with a competent adversary, whilst also measuring out enough time to explore themes and give characters room to discuss their feelings in between the turn-based combat. And I never felt this balance was reached. On one hand, it would feel like the game had said everything it wanted to, waiting for me to carry out the rest of the battle for the inevitable reconciliation. On the other hand, and this is where I personally think this issue hinders the game most, there are many battles where I feel the characters have not said or done nearly enough to justify the foregone conclusion of hug and make up. This really brings out the trouble with the game's catharsis. Once you deal your definitive blow, the game just kind of says, 
you're done, and tells you to make up. And you have this small exchange to summarize the reconciliation. And I never felt that the catharsis these resolutions brought was anything more than kind of cheap and unfulfilling. And the grandest slap in the face with this comes with the very last battle of the game, with Jala's grandmother. Can Jala speak across the generation gap and communicate with the terrifying matriarch of her family? More importantly, can she survive the EMOTIONAL DAMAGE? This battle is incredibly climactic. Not only was the dreadful visit from her grandmother teased across the whole game, but we get to see classic generational trauma in action and witness how Pati affected Jala's mother and how that also made its way down to Jala herself. It's a big moment. And of course, there is a lot of exchange in harsh remarks and difficult truths that get about 60% of the way there. But then, you deal the definitive blow, and your mom is just like, all right, let me handle this one, and you call her into the battlefield, and they hug? And that just makes everyone make up with each other? And then the game slam dunks you into the credits? Look, I had similar issues in another Annapurna game, If Found, where I felt the finale to that game did not feel as organic or understandable as I would have liked. But that game had a lengthy epilogue to really explore what comes after acceptance and alongside forgiveness over time. Here, it's just done. We have to believe that all the characters have said and done what they needed to, and now things can finally get better, when it feels like such an out-of-character change of heart and mind. Do you know how difficult it is to change someone's mind? Let alone make them realize something that's instigated turmoil for many, many years? It It's not as simple as that one Chris Gethard outtake. Oh, I will those bad words out of you. I will f that bad attitude right out of you, woman! Right! Oh, my bad. Oh, no, I see your point now. Yeah, no, that... Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, and it bugs me because I feel this game is actually very good at exploring difficult situations in digestible ways. My favorite scene of the game comes in one of its cooking segments, where Jala confronts her father about the truth of his supposed happiness when she came out to him. And it's sincere. It is an enjoyable exploration of the conflicting feelings one might have to this unexpected situation, and the endurance of love through continuously building acceptance. It was well done, and since the cooking minigames have a set amount of turns to execute, no more, no less, the writing is better able to pace itself when having this kind of a conversation. Unfortunately, in a circumstance as unconstrained to a linear structure as combat proves to be, such a pacing is far more difficult to achieve, especially with dialogue options that branch into different discussions and responses. It doesn't feel as natural, especially since the conclusion is inevitable. When the conversation is as dynamic and in the moment as many of these battles are, it's handicapped by its determination to meet the quota of an eventual reconciliation. So that's my main beef. That's where I feel this game doesn't quite land in its execution. But aside from that very important element to the whole, I still enjoyed the game. And for everything this game tries to be, a lot of it didn't stick with me. I never dedicated myself much to the skating, if that wasn't obvious. I never wanted to cook much, since it felt like such a tedious process in the long run to build up a decent stash of items that I never felt I really needed. If anything, I really like the side quests of this game, where you can follow up with your reconciled exes and complete missions for them, continuing to build a stronger bond. That's kind of what I wish this game did more, is build rather than just complete. Thirsty Suitors is a lot but it's okay in its hodgepodge of gameplay and emotional cacophony. Also, fun fact, you can make your grandma thirsty. Ooh, boy. Thanks a lot for the nightmares, Gam Gam. And those are all of the games that Annapurna Interactive published in the year 2023. 
and I'll I want to be honest. I'm super excited for what they're making next. Annapurna has like so many cool games coming out. Like it's unreal. You got Flock, which is like this really cool game. It's like a bird collecting game. You're riding birds and you're collecting birds and you can meet up with friends, whatever the hell that means. In the original run of Annapurna games, I didn't give a whole lot of time to the Souls-like game Ashen amongst that list. But now with We Kill Monsters, it looks like I'm gonna get a second chance to kind of dig deeper into that world World, and what a gorgeous world it is. You got two a T, which like, what is that madman creating over there? Well, Tom was such a strange experience, but also like a really existentially poignant one that I don't even, I don't even know what he's gonna do with this. A kid that's in a, <laughs> a kid that's T posing in a little town. Are we getting an open world T posing game? You have Lorelei and the laser eyes from Sigma, Sim, Simogo, and I just love the philosophy of this game studio to just make a completely different game every single time. I just love that they pour everything they can into this one concept, this one game, and make something really special. Granted, I've only played Sayonara Wild Hearts, and that's like up there in my top three, but I'm really excited to see what they got cooking up in this one. Annapurna is also throwing in their own self-developed games into the mix. Their first in-house developed game is a Blade Runner one, which I don't really, I don't really care that much about, but I mean, it's pretty cool. They are also co-publishing a Silent Hill game, which like, yes, please, I'll take that one uh, right now. <laughs> I want more horror games, please. Um, what else? Um, you got Ghost Bike, which is like a cool biking game. I'm up for that. I'm up for biking. I bike myself. You may not guess that from my physique and my complexion, but I bike. I bike. Lush Foil Photography Sim, a game that is literally just going to these beautifully exotic locations and snapping a quick pic. It looks cool. It's such a beautifully hyper-realistic game. Oh, it looks so cool. It's, honestly, that's going to be like a really fun wind-down game. Like after work, you're just sitting in your chair and you're like, I'm just going to take some photos in Iceland. Why not? That sounds like, that, that, that does sound like fun. I, I, I want to do that right now. But the point is, there are a lot of games coming from this publisher that I am super excited to play. And I'm also really excited to make videos on them because believe it or not, I mean this to be true. And I'm going to say as much as I can to convince you that it's true. The original Annapurna video really does have a special place in my heart. I mean, you don't spend seven months making that kind of a video and just be like, all right, I'm done. I'm not going to emotionally recover from this. <laughs> well, you, yeah, you do. So I'm very excited for that, and I hope that you enjoyed. I'm sorry that my voice is a little bit tattered. Things are a bit chaotic and in, in complete disarray over here on this side of the planet. So thank you all so much for watching. Um, I'll see you probably in another 12 months. <laughs> That's the video. How do I operate this thing? How do I operate this thing? Maybe if I push the button to record?